The Avengers. That's what we call ourselves. Sort of like a team. Earth's mightiest heroes type thing. Avengers, time to work for a living. That's my secret. I'm always angry. I am on the side of life. You get hurt, hurt them back. You get killed, walk it off. I'm here to talk to you about the Avenger Initiative. I'm your host, Andrew, and I'm here to talk to you about the Avengers. Welcome to episode 64 of Some Assembly Required, your weekly adventure into the annals of Earth's mightiest heroes, the Avengers. This week, we are taking a look at Avengers number 59. The name is Yellow Jacket. This week's issue is written by Roy Thomas, pencils by John Buscema, inks by George Klein, letters by Sam Rosen, and it comes to us in December of 1968. Starting off with our cover, it's a cover I really quite enjoy. Probably the biggest feature on here, aside from the oversized Goliath underneath the foot of Yellow Jacket, is in fact the texture behind Goliath, which I think is a really nice touch. But overall, again, I really enjoy the cover design. It sets a good feel and a good tone for the issue. It gives you a really good idea of what the issue is about. I love the colors and it serves as a good introduction to a classic Avengers character, Yellow Jacket. Now, the opening of this issue reminds us once again that this was written back in the 1960s and that things were a little bit different. So the issue starts off with something we've actually seen before, though, which is a organized crime heist of a furrier. Not to be confused with a farrier, which is someone who shoes horses, but a furrier who is someone who sells furs. Again, back in the 1960s, furs were still a luxury commodity, and the mobsters portrayed here really look like something out of Dick Tracy or uh, 1940s, 1950s film noir, which is an aesthetic I really enjoy. So when you mix that with superheroes, I have a lot of fun with it. But we see here Yellow Jacket confronting these gangsters who are robbing this fur store and really from the beginning yellow jacket makes quite the impression in the way he takes on the criminals he has a very aggressive approach and he portrays himself as someone who is supremely confident in their abilities it's obvious from page one and especially page two when we see him really get into the fight with the mobsters that a deliberate effort is made to make yellow jacket stand out from the rest of the avengers and in fact in a lot of ways he actually reminds me of of the Avengers villain Swordsman. I've talked before about how Swordsman has this kind of cocky swagger, this almost Captain Kirk kind of way he carries himself and that supreme confidence that Swordsman has. And Yellow Jacket has a very similar approach to things, although he is obviously super powered in at least some manner as we see him blasting Yellow Jacket stingers from his hands and or wrists, it's kind of in that general area. Of course, Yellow Jacket makes pretty quick work of these mobsters. Again, super powered character, Vice, a bunch of mob goons. It's not really a fair fight. Though I will say that John Buscema does a really great job in the fight artwork. It doesn't quite have the same energy as like a Jack Kirby fight, but there are a few panels that bring home the intensity and the visceral nature of this fight. There's one in particular towards the end of the fight where Yellow Jacket is punching an escaping criminal in the face and we get some really great facial and jaw distortion as his fist comes in contact with the criminal and I really like the look of that. Once the criminals have been taken care of, Yellow Jacket calls the police and brings them in to apprehend the criminals because he's still a superhero. He's a supremely cocky one, but he is in fact still a hero and this is one of those places where we see him differentiated from Swordsman in that Swordsman is typically a villain who maybe wants to join the Avengers or something like that, but he's definitely a villain. Whereas this sets the tone that although he may not fit in with the Avengers, Yellow Jacket is certainly a hero. Now, of course, what brand new superhero wouldn't be complete without a newspaper article declaring their arrival? And in the Marvel Universe, there is no other paper other than the Daily Bugle. So we get a great page worth of material. It's, it's six panels split over two pages, but it's really just a page's worth of material of some J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man. And, you know, while I'm not a huge personal Spider-Man fan, like Spider-Man's just not really my thing, I I've always loved the interaction, especially like the Silver Age interactions between J. Jonah Jameson and Spider-Man because it's always really comical. It's always that same 
slapstick. Spider-Man makes a joke. Jane Jonah Jameson gets all fired up response. So it's really predictable, but it's always a lot of fun. And anytime we get little splashes of it mixed in, I really enjoy it. I probably wouldn't enjoy it quite as much as I do if I were reading Spider-Man and it were a more regular interaction. But, uh, you know, I really enjoy it in the little bits and pieces we get. So from here, we cut to the Avengers in a training sequence. This is one of the things I really enjoy about the Avengers, and I think it's very fitting that we see them in a training sequence because we've added two new members to the team. In general, in superhero comics, and especially in team books like Avengers, and the other one that's really well known for it is X-Men with their danger room scenes, we get these training montages. It's a good way for characters to show off their abilities and for us to kind of see how they interact together as a team. So in this instance, we are seeing Black Panther dodging a boomerang arrow developed by Hawkeye. So we get to see Hawkeye developing his craft more, which I always love. And we get to see Black Panther demonstrating his acrobatic abilities, which are very impressive. Just as the Avengers are kind of getting into their routine, Vision brings up the fact that there is supposed to be an Avengers meeting, but that Hank Pym is missing, that he's supposed to be there, but that he's not. So they're going to go ahead and start the meeting without him and then bring him up to speed when he eventually arrives. And after Vision mentions this, we get an interesting little two-page montage from each of the other Avengers' perspectives. So it's two pages, four panels. Each page is split vertically. Vertically, which I think is an interesting way to do it as opposed to splitting it horizontally, which I think is the more typical way to do something like this. But we get a little bit of the inner monologue of each Avenger, and they are looking at kind of what's been happening really since we've seen them last. So we get to see Janet, who is interacting with Hank. And of course, Hank is just so deeply involved in his work. Once again, kind of forgetting about Janet. They were supposed to go on a date to a coffee shop, and Hank says, no, I can't do it. I got so much work to do and it, it's really kind of in contrast to what we've seen the last couple of issues where you know Hank is on the verge of proposing to Janet and life just kind of gets in the way but you know it's there you know how he feels you know what his intentions are he just needs to pull the trigger and so Janet's kind of going in her head and going over these frustrations we then see Black Panther and he is dressed as T'Challa and he's addressing the UN General Assembly Although he is speaking supremely confident and is talking about how Wakanda is taking its place among the community of nations, much like we saw at the very end of Black Panther in one of the Easter eggs. But in this case, we also see Black Panther's internal monologue trying to decide really what his destiny is. And we get to see these doubts and these questions. And it portrays him as a leader who is not infallible and is not fearless and is not this creature of myth and of... Of created persona. He's a real person inside. And I think it does a great job of making us see the human side of him, right? Yeah, he's this great leader and he is this superhero, but he's also a person and people have doubts and people have questions. There's more to a person than just this mask they put on, both in his case, literally and figuratively. It's one of the things that I think the Black Panther film really got right is that, you know, he, yes, he is this incredibly powerful character. He has this amazing commanding presence. Presence, but that inside he's still a young king and that comes with inexperience it comes with doubt it comes with questions all of that has to be addressed and this is T'Challa doing that in his mind trying to decide whether he's better serving the world as T'Challa king of Wakanda or as the Black Panther. Next, we get Vision, who is working very hard to fit into the human world. Because as much as Vision looks like a human, he's not, and it's very obvious. He certainly has a human build, but he has a red face and black eyes, and he's just very much not a human. He's trying to fit into this world and find out what else there is for him other than being an Avenger. You know, where Black Panther is trying to decide which destiny destiny is best for him and what where he can do the, the most good here vision is trying to decide is there anything else for me other than being an avenger do i mean more than just this and then finally we get hawkeye and much like he has been for many issues hawkeye is just generally concerned with black widow and with his relationship with her i both love this 
And it pains me a bit because the more this progresses and the more we see Black Widow working with S.H.I.E.L.D., I think the more we realize that this relationship isn't going anywhere, that it's hit its peak and it's coming down and Hawkeye just can't bear to let it go. And he's pining for her. He wants to be with her and it's just not going to happen, at least not in the way that he wants it to, which is unfortunate. It's also, I think, worth noting that of, of these four panels, I think the art in Hawkeye's panel is probably the strongest. I really like the look of Black Widow in this bubble machine of some kind and she got this mask on and there's this nerve gas swirling around her. It's a very well done effect and I really enjoy it. So again, all this is happening before the Avengers meeting starts. And as the team is kind of going through these mental exercises and gathering themselves for this coming meeting, we see Jarvis, the Avengers, we'll say semi-faithful butler, because of course, you know, several issues ago, we did have the issue with him trying to betray the Avengers to Ultron, though it was for what I would call valid and important personal reasons, right? He was trying to get money to save his mother, who was unwell. And here we see Jarvis doing a very butler-like thing to do, and that is polishing the silver, and he is taking just so much joy and is so excited for polishing the silver. Now, part of me, the part of me that is very OCD, gets this. Like, I, I also get excited for, like, that kind of thing, polishing and cleaning and things like that. I just don't have enough OCD and enough motivation to do it all the time. You know, my house is frequently a mess, but when I get to cleaning, man, can I clean. So I get where Jarvis is coming from here, but uh, unfortunately for Jarvis, he is attacked and once again tied up because unfortunately as a butler even one as good as Jarvis getting tied up is kind of a thing we get a brief glimpse at the individual who ties up Jarvis. However, we don't have to wait all that long, only two panels, to discover exactly who it is, and that is, again, Yellow Jacket. This is the first that the Avengers are seeing of Yellow Jacket, but even in the way he holds himself, he carries himself, there is a stance of very forced, very intentional masculinity and strength. He's got his hand on his belt buckle. Now, you know, he's just grabbing his belt buckle. But think of it more like a cowboy does it, or... In some cases, I've seen guys trying to be tough who walk around with, you know, their hand on the front of their pants. I'm not talking like Al Bundy here, although that's a, roughly the similar look of this, but I've seen guys with their, their thumbs tucked into their belt buckle or something to that effect, and it really is kind of this over-the-top display of masculinity and how confident and sure they are of themselves. I find it idiotic. However, I understand at least the thought process, the psychology, if you will, behind it. You know, obviously they are putting their hands near their belt buckle, but really they're trying to show off and display their masculinity, we'll say. They're drawing attention to their manliness. If you're not catching my drift, go ahead and send me a message on the Facebook page. I'll explain it to you further than that, but I, don't, I really don't think we need to go into that further. But you get the idea. So, here in his first interaction with the Avengers, he's already trying to show off how strong and manly and forceful he is, especially when the next thing that he admits to is having off Tank Pym. Yellowjacket kind of runs his mouth for a moment, and the re Avengers respond by saying, just wait till Hank gets here, he'll really show you, which is kind of funny because it's kind of like when you're a kid and one parent starts yelling at you and they say, oh, wait till, you know, mom gets home or wait till your father gets home. It's one of those like, oh, you're going to be in trouble when so-and-so gets here. We, we. We, we, we can't deal with you, but, but so-and-so, they're, they're really going to show you. And Yellow Jacket's response is, ah, I took care of that guy already. At this shocking news, Wasp collapses, which just irritates the ever-loving hell out of me because we fight so hard to get this character development of Wasp as a strong female character, as an independent character, and we've come a long way, and then we do something like this, and I think it really undermines the strength of Wasp, and it makes her into the, the helpless damsel in distress. And it's very unbecoming of the character. It's very undermining of the character development. But again, it's the 1960s and they just can't help themselves from doing this. So unfortunately, it's a thing whether we want it to be or not. But Wasp collapses and Yellow Jacket then proceeds to tell us the story of how he took out Goliath. Now, in general, I really like this fight because it's very fitting of both characters. Yellow Jacket sneaks up on Hank and he fights kind of dirty, but Hank really tries to outperform and outsmart Yellow Jacket. And to a large extent, he does. Although I will admit my one complaint about this fight is that Hank is 
is perhaps a little bit slower than I would expect and doesn't react quite as quickly as we've seen him do in the past. He doesn't change his size as rapidly as we know he can. And, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see a reason for this really given next issue because this, this plot line will actually continue from this issue into the next one. Uh, I, I really don't want to go too deep, deep into that this episode because I don't want to ruin the reveal next issue. But needless to say, there's a reason why Yellow Jacket's description of Hank doesn't quite fit. But in the end, Yellow Jacket gets the upper hand and then he forces Goliath to shrink to the size roughly of an ant and he leaves him to be captured and it appears killed by a spider. Now the panel of Goliath running from the spider is just, it's horrifying but it's wonderful. It is a wonderful bit of comic book art that is genuinely horrifying. Goliath running from this very, very well done, very detailed spider really taps into nightmare logic, nightmare fears and those those primal fears of being hunted really kind of digging into the audience's fight or flight reflex and most of us don't have a particularly kind reaction to spiders they're one of those things that not entirely universally but for a significant portion of the population we all kind of go ah and you know we immediately start reaching for big bug stomping boots lord knows i do and i'm a you know big six foot two almost 300 pound man and i am not in the mood to roll over and see a giant spider next to me let alone be chased by one and then put up in its web ah so those are the kinds of things that nightmares are made of and i think this panel and, and the next one to an extent really do a good job of demonstrating to the reader so of course after hearing all of this the avengers are in no mood to allow yellow jacket to remain let alone to join the avengers which is really what he has come here to do so of course what do superheroes do with someone they're not particularly pleased with well they attack him and although the avengers demonstrate really strong teamwork here in general i have to say that their response to yellow jacket in this fight in general is pretty underwhelming yellow jacket is able to get the upper hand pretty quick grabs Wasp, knocks her out, really puts her in a chokehold, and then takes off. And the other Avengers are afraid to do anything for fear of injuring Janet. Right, Hawkeye has a pretty clear shot at Yellow Jacket's back, but he doesn't shoot because he's not convinced that he won't hit Janet. I take a little bit of issue with this because if Hawkeye is as good as he's supposed to be, then it really shouldn't be an issue. But at the same time, I understand that just because Hawkeye feels it shouldn't be an issue doesn't mean he's willing to take the risk either. Unfortunately, from here, the issue takes a fairly significant downward trend. So we find Yellow Jacket and Wasp having retreated to Yellow Jacket's hidden tree fortress. Now, unlike most villains, because again, Yellow Jacket really is trying not to be a villain, he doesn't lock up Wasp. He has her just out, and he's trying to convince her that he's really not such a bad guy. And then he does something that is totally unacceptable, and this is really where the issue takes its downward spiral, is that he grabs Wasp, and he kisses her rather forcefully and based on her body language very much against her will and she even yells no stop let go you murdering and it, it's very apparent that wasp does not want anything to do with this even considering that this was written in the late 1960s and that the concept of consent was not then what it is now today this is still really not an acceptable thing to do and it sends a just awful message to young comic book readers that this kind of thing is okay. And again, I'm not even trying to impose a modern sensibility of consent and right and wrong on a book written in the 1960s. I think even by the standards of the time, yes, something like this may be portrayed in film, but with actual people, this is really far less acceptable than I think the comic makes it out to be. Now, of course, almost immediately Yellow Jacket starts apologizing for what he's done and while i understand that in reality this is starting to set up things that are happening in the next issue and it's all part of the plot it doesn't really do anything for me it doesn't really help alleviate the situation that we've just seen so it really feels like he knew he did wrong and he's just kind of trying to do a quick about face to cover that fact and to, to really cover himself in general 
shortly hereafter, the Avengers are out on the prowl looking for Wasp. They attack at City Hall, and the attack is just getting started when Wasp jumps in the middle and tells the Avengers not to harm Yellow Jacket. And when they demand a reason, we end the issue with Janet telling the Avengers that she's going to marry Yellow Jacket. Now, obviously, as I mentioned, this will lead into the story for next issue, but I always try and at least take a minute and evaluate how this would have looked to contemporary readers. The idea that Janet is suddenly willing to marry this guy who she's known for really less than a day, probably, and that claims to have killed the man she loved. And the little word bubble at the end says, next, the wedding. So that's obviously the direction in which we're headed, but it certainly makes me wonder, like, how they were going to sell this at the time. Is it some kind of Stockholm Syndrome type deal? Did Yellow Jacket reveal who he is to Janet and that's why she's willing to marry him? You know, there are a number of possibilities here, and without the knowledge that I have as a comic book reader in 2018, it's really hard to tell what direction they're going in. Now, again, looking back, I see little hints, so I knew where it was going, and then obviously I've read the next several issues, so I know where the story arc is going. So I don't have to guess, but I really think this is kind of interesting to look at from a contemporary point of view and try and figure out all the possible ideas and where this story was going to go next. Overall, this isn't the greatest story we've had. In the larger context of the next issue that we're going to look at next week, it goes a long way to furthering plot lines we've seen already. Again, I don't want to go into it too much because it will be a giveaway for next week's big reveal, and there's a lot of good things to talk about there, so I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But, you know, obviously, we have some questionable things going on in this issue, such as Yellow Jacket forcing himself upon Wasp, and really just kind of the way Yellow Jacket carries himself and addresses himself towards the other Avengers. Not really that enjoyable a character to introduce into the book. And so the, the story kind of hurts for that, right? It's very Yellow Jacket centric. So if you don't really like the character, it, it's hard to get behind the plot as a whole. Now, I will say that we have a lot of really good art in this issue, a lot of really fun fight scenes, and a lot of just really good momentary single shot panels. Like the last panel here of Janet is a great panel. You really can't call it a pinup because it's really is a shoulder and her head but it's a it's a great really portrait almost of Janet I love the facial expressions there is all kinds of emotion being conveyed just in her eyes you know we get the really great panels with the Avengers and kind of what's going on in their heads earlier so there there are things about this issue that are certainly redeemable but at the same time in the context of the larger issue those things don't make up for the issue's shortcomings Remember, you can find us at AvengersAssembly.com. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can find this podcast on iTunes, SoundCloud, and YouTube. If you'd like to be a part of the conversation, send your questions and comments to Andrew at AvengersAssembly.com. Next week, we'll be taking a look at Avengers number 60, Till Death Do Us Part. All right, hey. All right, good job, guys. Uh, let's just not come in tomorrow. Let's just take a day. Have you ever tried shawarma? There's a shawarma joint about two blocks from here. I don't know what it is, but I want to try it.